my dad. Well, I got to tell you, it's been a been quite an experience going through my first hurricane. How many of you had your first hurricane? Some of us, okay. Some of us are your veterans going, that was nothing. I thought it was something. It was pretty powerful to, uh, to prepare for it, to uh, experience it. Of course, I got in trouble because I went to sleep during the most intense part of it. Man, I wanted to be awake so bad. I went to sleep. You know, the wind would wake me up, and I'd wake up, and my wife was sitting there next to me like this, and I'd go, ooh, that's scary. <laughs> so she wasn't happy that I was like Jesus, resting on the boat in the midst of the storm. Um, and then the, the aftermath, you know, it's been everybody's cleaning up, everybody's worrying about somebody, you know. Joe's parents, they had to move out of the house because there's four feet of water in it. You know, Wayne, our bassist tonight, he, his roof got all jacked up. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of pain and struggle. Angie's taking care of all kinds of people at the Hope Center right now. In fact, if we need, what do we need, Angie? Right now, the most thing that we need is water. We have no water. Water. Um, and items for like clothes tonight and the Water and protein. Yeah, instead of taking it back to the store, give it to the Hope Center. Okay. And, and as a pastor, you know, I've gotten all kinds of questions. Like, why? And, and so I want to, I, I know we've already talked about this twice. I'm going to talk about it a third time. There's a passage in Isaiah 45. It's one of my favorites because it's just so powerful. It's God, 45.7. I form light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, the context is God talking to Cyrus. He says, I, I, to Cyrus, whose right hand I will take hold of, to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, to open doors behind him so that gates will not be shut, excuse me, before him. I will go before you. I'll level the mountains. I'll break down gates of bronze. I'll cut through bars of iron. I'll give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you the title of honor. Though you do not acknowledge me, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men will know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. I form light. I create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Then he says in verse 9, Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. So I want to talk about that quarrel a little bit. Because I've been surprised by people's reactions to the hurricane. Okay, Why would God allow this? Now, I'm surprised that people are surprised. I mean, there have been hurricanes, storms throughout history, right? You know, as far as you can go back into history, you're going to find there were storms. And, and you have to know that storms weren't originally intended. They didn't arrive until we introduced sin into the world. And then humanity now had you know, moral sin, and what was surprising is the natural world was negatively Im impacted. We talked about this for two weeks in a row. The good news is there does come an end to these destructive forces. Revelation 21, and there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. Okay, we got something good to look forward to. 
However, there are questions from Christians that surprise me. Um, Pastor, I prayed that God would push the storm off the land so that nobody would get hurt. And instead, it attacked the Virgin Islands and the Keys and Cuba and Florida. How can I trust God if he won't answer my prayers? So it was a little bit baffling to me because actually... Um, this person is somebody that I consider a good Christian, okay? Now, that's a good thing to know because you can be a good Christian and still be confused, right? But here's the deal. You shouldn't be confused. Um, I would suggest that your prayers were not unanswered. This was supposed to be a catastrophic event, And when it got to us, it's a level two. And look what it did. Okay? So it sounds like your prayer was answered. I noticed that Jose did something weird. It just did a circle. And then it went out into the ocean. Almost as if God was saying, my people have had enough. I'm going to take hurricane number two and do the loop-de-loop and send it out. Reminds you of Judges when when the Lord says he could stand the misery of his people no longer. Well, the unanswered prayer, it's the reason that so many used to go to church. People will say, I asked God to do something and then he didn't pull through, so I don't believe anymore. Or at best, I'm an agnostic. And and it blows my mind that that, that long-time Christians and churchgoers can see a hurricane and drift away from God. I mean, how's that possible? Why isn't your faith more grounded? Why haven't the truths of our faith anchored your relationship with God? How can you so easily depart from the one who gave his son to remove your sin and has given you his Holy Spirit so that you're always in the presence of God? How can you have this and then see something like a storm and decide to drift away. And maybe it's not a hurricane. Maybe it's a storm that happens in your personal life. Those bother us. Okay? If God's going to allow this, then I, I, I don't want to follow him anymore. I was so moved. I read a secular book about the concentration camps. And, and what was surprising is Christians in the concentration camps used their time to explain God's plan of salvation through the Old Testament to Jesus, and hundreds of thousands of Jews gave their lives to Christ before they were murdered. Okay? Now, it's surprising because I tried to put myself in that spot, and basically what you're saying is, okay, this is my new reality, and it is truly a living hell, And so I'm going to release my God, the only hope that we have in the midst of a living hell. Now, I'm sure there were Christians who crossed their arms and said, I can't believe God would allow this to happen to me. I can't believe that God would allow this kind of evil on earth. And yeah, okay, pretty radical evil. Let's let's back off with attitude. That's pretty intense, okay? And I'm sure that there are people who said, if you're going to allow this, then I don't want anything to do with you anymore. But here's the problem. See, there's a fundamental misunderstanding taking place. It's about who's the boss. Friends, God does not exist to be at our beck and call. We think, God, I don't like this. Do something about it. And I'll give you a couple of days. Come on, how many of us have prayed that way? I'll tell you what's really amazing is how often he is at our beck and call. How often he does take care of us and does answer us and care about small things, big things, all things. You know, he's not our genie and yet he sure is an amazing one to care about us. But but let me get the priority list straight. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 We exist for him. He doesn't exist for our comfort. We exist for him. 
We're called to go forth and make disciples. We're called to be about the Father's business. We're called to be ready in season and out of season. We're called to live as Christ and to die as gain. Wherever, whenever, however, we're called to distribute it, the presence, the promises, the power of Jesus Christ. That's what your life is supposed to be anchored to and anchored about if you call yourself a Christian. Now, if you're like me, you kind of have to do a little bit of a lifestyle adjustment when you hear this. It's a couple of times putting this message together, I, I had to go and write out a prayer. Lord, I feel like I'm in a little selfish lately. Okay? Because it's so easy to make it about yourself. And, and we need to say, wait a minute, I exist for him. And there's such a freedom when you just, all of a sudden, what you're caring about no longer is driving the bus. You've put the right driver at the drive wheel, and now you get to go on his journey. And his journey is a pretty good one, okay? I'm not saying that there aren't some difficulties. I was reading in, in Corinthians, and, and Paul says, he says that he was in Ephesus, and I found an open door, and there was a lot of opposition, so I'm going to stay here a while. Okay? Now, that's just not usually the way I do opposition. Opposition, I'm leaving. He stays $50,000 worth of occult material gets burned, and the city becomes Christ-centered. Okay? Because he stayed in opposition. He didn't get mad and leave. He stayed because he saw the opportunity. Now, if he was looking personally at the situation, would he have stayed? No. But he saw the spiritual opportunity, so he stays. And by the way, this is one of God's specialties, to show up in the midst of our trials. Okay. Sadly, he usually shows up late to exercise our faith, you know, he wants to see, are we really trusting in him or are we just using him for an advantage? And, and he shows up and he redeems sin, our sin. He fixes brokenness, brokenness that we make, brokenness that other people do to us. He removes our pain because our focus is no longer on me, it's on him. And, and friends, I think it's when our prayers seem unanswered that we most need to trust God. Jesus, um, Job said, though he slay me, I will trust in him. Well, that's powerful. Though he slay me, I will trust in him. How about when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm going to throw you in the fire if you don't worship the golden idol that I've made. And they said, oh, king, you know, <clears throat> You don't need to play the music and see if we're going to bend our knees because we're not going to bend our knees. You know, well, we believe in God and he can save us and he will save us from your hand. And even if he doesn't, let it be known to you that we will not bow to your idols. Okay. It doesn't matter what's going on that even your life is at stake. You have a relationship, a commitment to God. One more, Habakkuk, the prophet, he says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, the produce of the olive fail, the fields yield no food, the flocks be cut off from the fold, there's no herd in the stalls. Do you get what's going on here? It's nothing. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. This is important for us American materialists to think about. When everything's not working out, are you going to blame God or are you going to praise God? You have to make that decision. Because really you have two options. You can have a contractual relationship with God. <clears throat> You know, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, and therefore you're going to have to fulfill all of your promises to me. Okay? And if you don't answer the prayer the way I wish, then I'm going to reject you. Well, first of all, 
you're not going to be able to fulfill your part of the contract with God because you've got sin and you can't meet his standards. That's why Jesus came. We weren't able to meet the standards. So he came and lived the life we should have lived, died the death that was ours to die so that we now get to live eternally the life he's given to us. You can't do a contractual thing. I did all this for you, God. Well, you know, we think we're living correct, but did we overlook caring for broken people and hurting people and homeless people? Yeah, we forgot about all those other really important things. We think just because we don't swear that, that we're okay. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of other sins that are kind of more important to God. Now, I'm not trying to encourage you to swear. How about this? What if you just decide to enter into a relationship with the Father whereby we make an unconditional commitment to the one who made an unconditional commitment to us? He gave us his son. And it's not, it's not a shabby gift when you realize that he was in the beginning creating everything that we enjoy and all things are made for him. That part of the Trinity, God, sacrificed himself. The source of life subjected himself to death so that all of us can have life. You know, yesterday <clears throat> I was talking with Neil and it said it pleased the Lord to do this. It pleased him, made him happy to have his son killed so that you could be restored to him. Do you see what kind of love he has for you? It's, it's amazing. It really, really is amazing. Well, the more we understand his ways, the less we need to trust him. And what does that mean? Well, the more we walk with him and understand that, that he's in control, then we don't cross our arms and say, explain yourself to me, Lord. You know, we just go, ah, he's a good God. And I don't understand what's going on. But I've walked with him long enough now to know that, that it's going to be all right. And that brings us to our passage, Isaiah 45. I bring prosperity and create disaster. Now, does this mean that God is the cause of evil? No. It means that regardless of how chaotic things appear in the world or in your life, God is in control. When you read the Bible, God represents himself as the absolute sovereign over the whole universe. All of nature, all of government, and all of us, our wayward hearts, everything under his control. This means God overrides and overrules. He works out his plan in history. And, and you know, in the, our text... You have to understand something. This was written 150 years before Cyrus was born. And the Lord said, I am going to guide you by the hand and make you the king of everybody. Calls him by name 150 years before Cyrus in some far off country that Isaiah is not even aware of becomes king. He announces it. And... The reason is because God has Babylon taking the Israelites into captivity and he's already got a plan to bring them out of it 150 years before they even go into captivity. Do you see how much control God has over the affairs of the world? This is pretty radical. And then there's all kinds of nations that Cyrus conquers. Nations, I, I, some of them, you know, I never heard of. The Syrians, the Assyrians, the Arabians, the Cappadocians, the Phygians, the Lydians, the Carians, the Phoenicians, the Bactrians, the Indians, the Babylonians. You need to know that when Cyrus conquered Babylon, it's, it's talked about in Daniel 5. And the way they did it is they diverted the flow of the river, the Euphrates, so that the water would go to the nearby swamps and they could then walk in on the riverbed to take over the city. But check this out. The riverbed had gates of bronze. So you couldn't just walk in. You couldn't just swim in. But do you remember that passage that I read? 
It says, I will go before you to subdue nations, to open doors so that gates will not be shut, to break down gates of bronze. Do you know that the gates in the rivers to Babylonian were bronze? And for some unknown reason, they were all unlocked. See what God did? He opened the gates of the city for Cyrus. 150 years ahead of time. Now, you know what's amazing? Is it says in Ephesians 1.4 that we were predestined before the foundation of the world to walk with him. And so it's no big deal that God had a plan for Cyrus 150 years before he was king, which means he has a plan for you that started long before you even existed. Kind of impressive, isn't it? Do you see how history is actually his story? And, and friends, God has two purposes in mind. The one is to bring himself glory. People will say, well, he's a megalomaniac. Why does he need everybody to praise and worship him? Because he knows that we made in his image to be in a relationship with him, the best thing that we can do is to connect ourselves to the source of life, abundant life, eternal life. That positive relationship is the best thing for all of us. It's not because he has a, he's insecure and, and has a, a fragile ego. No, because he knows that when we're in that place, of worship and adoration, and we see this God who loves us so intensely, yes, then our lives are going to work correctly. And, and the, second, the second thing is this. His purpose is to preserve a people for his glory. God used Cyrus to bring his people back and to bring the Jews back so that Jesus will then come forward like it was originally planned. And here's where it gets really cool. When he says, you know, I am the source of light and dark, good and evil. Cyrus was a Persian who was exposed to a dualistic concept of God and the world. See, the good God who created light was called Ahura Mazda. Anybody drive a Mazda? And the evil God, creator of darkness, was Angra Mina. And God is telling Cyrus that there is not two gods or forces in heaven or on earth, not one good and one bad God. All things are under his control, and nothing happens without his permission. And John Calvin, he clarifies, undoubtedly the Lord is no representative of evil, but he does make use of evil so it can bring forth good. You saw what Harvey did, all that devastation, and you saw how people came together. Okay? And started caring about each other. I mean, it even happened on my street. The neighbor that doesn't like me, I went and cleaned up all the debris in front of his house. Okay? And I wanted him to know it was me, but he wasn't around. <laughs> so did I get it right and do it anyways? Or was it a wasted opportunity? I did it for the Lord. Okay? That's the way we have to think. It isn't about brownie points. It's about, Lord, I'm going to take care of the guy that doesn't even like me. Well, and we won't go into why he doesn't like me, okay? <laughs> it's nothing to do with the motorcycle at 5 a.m., okay? <laughs> but here's what you got to know. God allows evil, and he uses it to accomplish his, his eternal purposes. We all know the passage, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. And regardless of how messy things look on the outside, God is at work behind the scenes in our lives accomplishing eternal purposes. I think we forget that we have an eternal agenda. Our lives have a purpose way bigger than making something happen here on earth. Now, I need to point out that the scriptures teach that all things work together for good, not that all things are good. 
There's a lot of bad in this world. But all things work together for good. And it's for who? Those who love the Lord and are called to his purposes. And this isn't meant to be an exclusiveness. <clears throat> you know, we have uh, all things working together, and you don't. <laughs> no, that's not the way it works. Okay? It's just that we have a purpose beyond this world. Whether we get ahead or we lose everything, we haven't really lost much because we have an eternity with God. And when our focus is on that, it changes the way suddenly you don't live to have the most toys. Suddenly you realize, I got enough, I'm going to share with others. One of my mentors at a couple churches ago, he figured out that he just needed $200,000 to live on, and he gave the rest of his $600,000 away. Didn't collect it, didn't give it to his children. He put it into spiritual motion. Okay? And that's the way we need to be thinking and living. And I want you to hear me. The Bible never says, figure it out. The Bible always says, trust in God. And it says it a whole bunch of times. And how many of us are trying to figure it out? And how are you doing with that? <laughs> if you knew how many theology books I have read... And I still can't figure it out. But I can trust. And when I trust, guess what happens? You know, on <clears throat> Hurricane Sunday, when we could have and should have had church, um, I figured that there were going to be people who didn't know. They didn't get the memo. And sure enough, people came. And so we had a little service in here. It's kind of, ah, no, it's better that you weren't here, you know, but it's better to be safe. But Bill Vanderbush and I, we put out, maybe you got the video, we put out a little video, and we had a little prayer time. Some of the hardcore folks came. Some of the visitors showed up. But you know what? I wanted something from God. And so when everybody was gone, I stayed here. And it was kind of awkward because my, my head was just full of all these thoughts. And I had to keep pushing them away, pushing them away. I couldn't focus because I was trying to accomplish too much because the rain started coming. And the wind started blowing. And I thought, well, you better get home for the hurricane. And I thought, no, I got business to take care of here. And so I stayed an extra hour. And I waited and I prayed and I stirred in the presence and I was over there, I, I was over where you were, when all of a sudden, the Lord broke through to me. And he told me, this is what I want you to pray about. And then he said, I want you to also pray about this. And a few other things came forward. And so then I went home, had a hurricane, came back. <laughs> and do you not know that on Tuesday morning, both of those things that I lifted up before the Lord were answered? How's that? No, no, check it out. This is what's amazing. I stayed here. I waited. I wasn't going anywhere until he showed up. And I wonder, once I heard the rain, I went to the window and checked it out. Maybe I better go home. Okay? But I didn't go home. And how many times do you want to hear from the Lord, but you got all those emails, and so you just go to work? How many times do you look at your to-do list and go, huh, Lord, be with me today, and you don't take the time? And how many of us have something big going on in our lives? I know it's everybody. And we really need to hear from God. It really wants something from God. And we'd like to experience his word, his presence, a warmth in our heart or just to settle our minds on the promises of the Bible. It, it, you know, sometimes it takes a little extra effort. But he's going to acknowledge those who seek will find. And sometimes it takes a little extra effort. You don't have to figure it out. I, I think one of the marks of spiritual maturity is confidence that God is in control 
And you know, you don't need to understand everything. Let him be God. He can open up gates that are supposed to be locked. He can change the hearts of your enemies. He could change your heart to, you know, how many times has this happened? Boy, I got a problem with so-and-so. And the Lord says, actually, let's start with you. Me? And if you're willing to go there, he'll show you, yeah, it was you, actually. Yeah, you know, then you're asking God to forgive them, and suddenly, oh, God, help them forgive me. Okay? But that's a beautiful thing, because when you get that close to the Lord, and he starts to guide you, you enter into a whole different level of spiritual maturity. Because now God can speak and direct and change and guide and do powerful reconciliation because you're willing to be open. You're willing to wait and let him talk to you. You're willing to hand over your agenda. That's the hard one, isn't it? And really, if we live to give God glory and everything, then it doesn't matter what happens. Remember when Job, he has all that bad stuff happen to him, and his wife says, curse God and die. And he says, you know, you speak as one of the foolish women. Shall we not accept good from God and not adversity? Okay. And he prays God. Well, the psalmist prayed, your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Psalm 77, 19. You know, want to know how people see God's footprints? It's when we're following in Jesus' steps. That's how they see God. You know, <clears throat> USA Today's headline was, Faith Groups Provide the Bulk of Disaster Recovery in, re in Coordination with FEMA. Who's out there helping with the disaster? Faith groups. That's us. Okay, and this is what Jesus' people do. People who go to religious service give far more to charity than those who don't. Billions of dollars of charity and care is provided by religious hospitals or, or millions of hours in community service by church members. It's, it's, it's us. We step forward and show the world this is how you're supposed to live. We set the example. We set the standard. And everybody goes, yeah, that, that, that's the right way to do it. And they might not even acknowledge God. Remember, Cyrus doesn't acknowledge God, but ends up doing God's will. We can have everybody following God's will if we're willing to follow our Lord Jesus. Well, we're supposed to be the salt and light of the world. So let me ask, <clears throat> does that sound like your life? Does that sound like the way you've been behaving? Does that sound like the way you order your day, order your calendar, order your checkbook, order your conversations so that you are a dispenser of hope and encouragement and blessings to other people? I already admitted I had to go right down on my prayer sheet. Lord, I've been a little bit selfish lately. Sometimes we forget, and we think it's about me, and we measure everything about how it affects my life. And we need to turn it around and say, wait, you've got my life. I just need to get busy with your calling. In fact, I'm going to say this. Is my life part of the ongoing stream of fighting pain and suffering and evil? And, and, and I bring it up because if your response to a natural disaster is, why are you allowing this to happen to me? It indicates that everything's all about you. And as long as everything's all about you, it's going to be a very small world. Because our life is all about God. When you say, wow, Lord, I'm still alive. How can I help others? The Holy Spirit flows. It determines the power of the Spirit that's going to come through you. When it's all about me, it stops here. When it's all about him, it's the Amazon River flowing powerfully. So are you strategizing on ways to release the power of God to other people, to bring his spiritual healing? Now, I was talking to one of our Stephen ministers yesterday. 
And he said he has a missionary friend in China, sees miracles all the time. What is that disease where somebody's all crippled up? Is that uh, muscular or whatever it is? The hands are unreleasing regularly. That's what his friend in China said. Now, I got a friend in China. He goes over there to get cheap labor so we can bring back goods and make a killing. He's a Christian. I never hear him talking about the miraculous hand of God moving. Two Christians. One is seeing incredible miracles. And the other, uh, I don't walk away inspired. I'm not beating up on him. I'm saying, are people walking away from you and me inspired? Is the miraculous taking place in our, in our lives? Because if not, I got some good news for you. You decide to keep an eye on Jesus, and you know what's going to happen? The miracles are going to start to flow. Just the way it is. I had dinner with a couple of pastors last night. It was like miracle sharing. It was so inspiring, so cool. And here's what I want you to know. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can be a source of abundant life for yourself and others. Hear me, friends. God is nearer. He's more tangible. He, has a, a, he wants to make his presence known in ways that are way beyond what we ever thought. What is Ephesians 3.20? Beyond what you can think or imagine? Yeah, that's what he wants to do in and through you. He longs to make us to be in tune with him, to get his guidance, to get his empowerment, to, 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 see his, to experience his presence. Do you experience his presence? Or do you go to the Bible and read a chapter and check that spiritual block? Okay? Because if you want to go ahead and put the pencil down and say, Lord, I want you today. I need you today. Pastor says I can have more of you today. Guess what's going to happen? more of him will start to show up. And it might be that all of us need to take an extra hour during the week and say, hey, I'm not leaving until something happens between us. I'm pretty sure something's going to happen. And if it doesn't, come talk to me. We're going to go over your experience, and I'll give you uh, <clears throat> a fresh assignment. Because the promise from God is something will happen. And that's pretty cool. Almighty God wants to do something in your life. And it shouldn't surprise you because it says we are his workmanship. When you were made in the image of God, when you were made in the image of God, with your particular fingerprint that's different from everybody else's you are specifically specially made you have your own ministry you and God in whatever sphere of influence and community that he's placed you in have the more powerful voice than anybody else you know I could go to your friend you know I used to have this buddy he would set me up with people and go hey uh, save that person's soul and walk away and that person would look at me, and I would look at my buddy, and, you know, so awkward. But, you know, if he would have stayed there and said, listen, I've been reading my Bible. I've been figuring things out with God, and I want you to have this. I mean, that's power. And that's the conversation that you could be, and I'm going to say should be having. Because you were made, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Remember I said the beginning of the world? Before the foundation of the world? That's when your calling was created. Well, I'm rambling on here, but I want you to know something. Don't discount yourself. You and the Holy Spirit, it's a powerful team. Powerful team. And you might talk to that one person who's insignificant. And that one insignificant person happens to be the black sheep of their family, and their family is a powerful family, 
and you just release the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit now gets released into that powerful family who has all kinds of connections, and the next thing you know, boom! That's often how he does it. That's why he says those who seem to be least significant or have great honor, because the least significant, they don't have, they're not full of themselves to get in the way of God showing up and allowing them in and releasing them to others, and that's why they get the greater honor. Well, you have the Holy Spirit. I'm wrapping things up here. And this Holy Spirit lives inside of you. It says the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in Romans, okay, that's the spirit that's inside of you. Remember the spirit that authored the words of the scriptures? That's the spirit that's inside of you. Remember the spirit that moved on the disciples and they did all kinds of miracles? That's the spirit inside of you. The one that hovered over the surface of the deep when God said, let there be whatever he said, when he breathed into the, the human and it became a living soul, okay, who impregnated Mary with the divine presence, that's your power source. And so when I say you can make an eternal significance, an eternal impact, I'm not just saying religious stuff to you. I guess I'm challenging you. Are you tired of just a ho-hum Christianity? Because what you're supposed to be doing, what you could be doing, what's normal Christianity, New Testament stuff, is still available today. It's available today. Well, a lot of words left. The one word I want you to know is this. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus is our source. Jesus said, let me go and give you the Spirit. Jesus said, let me point you to the Father. Jesus said, I and the Father are one, and you're in me, and I'm in you. And friends, that's our identity. We are the children, the ambassadors, the friends of God. And any friend of his? That's somebody to know. And I think that's somebody that everybody you know should know. So Lord, tonight, I pray that you would release a fresh on every one of us, a clear understanding of who we are and whose we are. I pray tonight, Lord, that when we have a hurricane, that this is just a great opportunity to start talking about you. When everybody's scared to point to you. When things went wrong, we get to come alongside and, and be your ambassador. That we would see the world the way you see it. Opportunities for grace. Lord, would you release yourself on everybody here? Everybody here, Lord. You know who needs healing. You know who's hurting and struggling. You know who's dealing with something emotionally. You know who's here smiling big because, wow, you're always showing up. We celebrate you. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. The name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Friends, I got some prayer warriors who are going to be over here for you. I got communion ready to deliver to you. Judy, would you uh, make sure the communion gets out to everybody? Friends, most importantly, I want you to take